is crossed by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts and Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. Of all the archaeological finds I've come across, when I heard about it, my jaw actually dropped. I'm on a quest to connect the clues and rediscover the stories hidden among Britain's ancient pathways. I want to find out what it is that tempts today's travellers to go back in time and rediscover these mystic tracks. Do you reckon that's the North Star? It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> smell a leather, you can still smell it. 1900 year old leather, isn't that absolutely amazing? This week I'm in Derbyshire walking the Portway, a prehistoric path through the Peak District. I want to know what this journey across the heart of England can tell me about the history and legends of ancient Britain through the stories, songs, and stone along its track. Yay! These are the paths our ancestors once followed, the ancient tracks that we in Britain can still walk today. is a geological wonderland of remarkable rock and stone. So it's appropriate my journey along its ancient portway path that connects caves, carvings and quarries begins at a rather imposing rock rich with local legends of the spiritual and satanic. This is the Hemlock Stone. Some stories say it was an object of worship carved by druids, while another legend had the devil himself hurl the hemlock at a particularly pious priest. When you come straight at it out of the forest, it does look pretty impressive, but whether it's to do with devils or druids or a rather efficient piece of natural erosion, the great Midlands novelist D.H. Lawrence wasn't very impressed by it. Look, this is a copy of Sons and Lovers from 1960. Rather pleasantly racy cover that, I think. Anyway, uh, he says about the hemlock stone, it's a little gnarled, twisted stump of rock, something like a decayed mushroom standing out pathetically on the side of a field. But rock and stone are key to understanding this part of England. <laughs> Lawrence's ambivalence is perfectly in character, but he protests too much. This place is remarkable, and the Hemlock Stone marks a perfect connection for me between the physical nature of this area and the people who lived here. Communities as resolute and proud as the rocks that shape this land. My journey takes me from the Hemlock Stone along the ancient portway track from the edge of Nottingham through the magnificent mineral-rich landscape of the Peak District National Park, with its diverse geological bedrock, to one of the region's most dramatic viewpoints, Mam Tor. Along the way, I'll enjoy the beautiful songs of this ancient land. Have a bird's eye view into a terrifying abyss, and unearth my very own hidden treasure. I'll bless them, I can see two little faces. D.H. Lawrence, this magnificent landscape has inspired such other literary giants as Daniel Defoe and Arthur Conan Doyle. But way before these great writers immortalised this beautiful land, the centuries-old path that I'm walking on served as a key trade route from the ancient Bronze Age right up until the Middle Ages. So why is the portway called the portway? 
Well, we're slap bang in the middle of England here, so it's pretty doubtful whether there would ever have been an enormous medieval port anywhere around here. <laughs> I'm sorry. This uh, little gap was made for someone slightly slimmer than me. This is the portway proper, and it could be that the word portway is simply an Anglo-Saxon word for main road. There is another rather cute idea that it means port as in a harbour or a protected place, somewhere that was a haven for the weary traveller. It's very poetic, but I'm not quite sure how strong it is as an explanation. <laughs> However the landlocked portway got its name, this land's subterranean nature inspired Conan Doyle to describe Derbyshire as hollow. Could you strike it with some gigantic hammer, he wrote, it would boom like a gigantic drum. And the underground theme picks up here in the mining town of Worksworth, where inside St Mary's, a beautiful 13th century church, I'm about to see Britain's oldest lead miner. When you come to a little place like this, you might well think, why has it got such an enormous church? And the answer, of course, usually is because at one time or another, the area was making a lot of money. And that's certainly true of Worksworth. Its money came from lead. The interior of this church is like one of those charity shops that's so well stocked that when you get in there, you can't believe your luck. Look at this carving, which is set into the stone. You see it? They call it the Queen of Hearts because of the heart-like shape of the body. And there is another one on the other side of the door. <laughs> this is really funny. But that's Goliath. And then there's tiny little David above him. I really can't imagine that that David could have defeated that Goliath, can you? And there's carvings all around this gorgeous church. But there is one carving here that is very much simpler and is actually my favourite in the whole church. Rosa, who is that little chap? Right, this is Toad Man of Bonsall. What man? The old man, to old man. Oh, to old man? Yeah. Um, of Bonsall? Of Bonsall, which is a lead mining village just down the road from us. What's so significant about him? We think he could be the oldest representation of a lead miner uh, anywhere in the world. How do you know that's a lead miner and not just some bloke carrying a stick? Yeah, he's got his uh, pick and his kibble, his basket, for carrying the lead in it. It looks like his lunchbox. Yeah, he could have taken his sandwiches as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's tantalising, isn't it, mm. that we don't know how old he is. He's like a voice calling at us from the very distant past. Yeah, it's a real mystery. I mean, it's sort of part of the beauty of him, in a sense, that we can't date him. But it's sort of literally tracing, um, you know, our ancestors. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For me, this small but mighty toad man represents the centuries-old miners whose rich pickings were traded along Portway's ancient track. The industry continued through generations with everything from humble homes to glorious cathedrals clad with Derbyshire lead. You can see the hardiness etched on the faces of these men who risked life and limb earning a living extracting this precious bounty. They'd often be cut off from daylight for days at a time, chipping and drilling away at some redoubtable rock face. This job was only for the hardest of the hard. All around this area are hundreds of vertical lead ore shafts plunging more than 30 feet below ground. But it's above ground where I'm about to experience my very own piece of classical rock. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. It's like the opening bars of a symphony. Ba -da! They say that Derbyshire's most famous export is Derbyshire itself. 
huge hunks of it being hacked off and sold. You can see the evidence, can't you, all along this rock face. Picks and axes, countless millions of them attacking these rocks. And see up there, see that, that pipe? Blokes used to dangle from there on ropes and drill holes so they could whack the explosive in. Boom! More money being made. See, I always think of Derbyshire as completely landlocked, with Merseyside about 60 miles in that direction, the wash about 90 miles over there. But what these rocks tell us is that where we're standing now was once a prehistoric tropical lagoon that was teeming with life and is now full of tiny bits of fossilised sea creatures. The most fascinating, from my point of view, being that. That is the tooth of a little shark which once swam along the coast of Derbyshire about 300 million years ago. This immense quarry face provides a traveller like me with a glimpse into the area's fascinating past. And it was the chronicles of one such fellow traveller that offered a unique insight. He may be most famous for transforming his global journeys into the story of the world's most famous castaway, but it was his homeland that provided inspiration for the travelogue, a tour through the whole island of Great Britain. It was, of course, Daniel Defoe. I think for most people like me, Daniel Defoe has always been the bloke who wrote Robinson Crusoe, yeah. full stop. But then he writes the tour. What's that all about? The tour, I think, came at a period of his life really towards the end. He's in his 60s. And I think the tour really is an accumulation of bits and bobs, facts and figures, and also his only memories and experiences of earlier travels around the country. And he's accumulated all these bits and bobs and he puts it together, I think, in, in the three volumes that are the tour. It's funny, isn't it? Because today we're so used to Bill Bryson and all the other travel writers mm. who go around Britain reflecting it in a whimsical and ironic way. But presumably, in Defoe's time, there weren't many of these people. Well, no, there were a few travel writers, but there were antiquarians, so they were going to, I'm going to tell you about Britain's past. But Defoe, I think, was doing something new. He was trying to give you an, a, a kind of view of the country as a whole, as it is now, and also its future. So it's partly a travel account, but also partly a state of the nation. What does he think of Derbyshire? Derbyshire really interested him because what he wanted to get to, and in fact what he does throughout the tour, is to try and attack or critique the kind of ancient myths of Britain. He calls them the wonderless wonders. What were they? So, uh, there's places like uh, Eldon Hole, there is uh, Mam Tor, there's uh, the Giant's Tomb, and, and these places, a lot of these places, he sees as mere products of nature. He says, well, this is perfectly natural. There's nothing incredible or curious about them. We explain them through rational means. With his detailed and exhaustive travelogue, Defoe explored all around the Peak District, dismissing the so-called Seven Wonders and instead delighting in writing about the obscure, both natural and man-made. The defining profound experience for Defoe would come at the end of a long hike to the atmospheric Harborough Rocks. He'd been in search of a fabled giant's tomb, but what he saw that day and what he scribbled in his journal had stopped this hardened traveller in his tracks. Defoe writes, When we came close up, we saw a small opening, not a door, but a natural opening into the rock, and the noise we'd made brought a woman out with a child in her arms and another at her foot. Says I, good wife, why, where do you live? Here, sir, says she, and points to the hole in the rock. Here, says I, and all these children live here too? Yes, sir, says she, they were all born here. Pray, how long have you dwelt here then, said I. My husband was born here, said she, and his father before him. I asked the poor woman what trade her husband was. She said he worked in the lead mines. I asked her how much could he earn a day there. She said if he had good luck, he could earn five pence a day.
Defoe was awestruck. He discovered a family of cave dwellers living a life of almost primeval simplicity. They wanted for nothing, said the writer. It was a lecture to us all. This stark truth sent him onwards, questioning the very meaning of life. The beautiful yet challenging character of Derbyshire's ancient portway path is defined by people of indomitable spirit who have forged identities among its rugged landscape. This influence and the working class roots of one of Britain's literary giants came to revolutionize the modern novel and shock the establishment to its core. Above the village of Middleton stands Mountain Cottage, the final home in England for an enfant terrible of the written word, the creator of the semi-autobiographical Sons and Lovers, and the notorious Lady Chatterley's lover. D.H. Lawrence was born in Nottinghamshire in 1885, the son of a miner. But unlike many of his childhood contemporaries, it would be words, not rocks, that the writer would come to mine. Frida Lawrence once said that if you wanted to understand her husband, you had to know that he came from the Midlands, which she called the navel of England, a strange black country with an underworld quality which is rather frightening, which rather sums up how I've always felt about his work. And it's this dark undertone that persists as I delve deeper into Lawrence's life Nothing. here in the Peak District. Yeah. Nottingham's a lot more dynamic, it's got yeah. two big universities. Stephen, this is now a beautifully renovated house. It is. With these great, bold, artistic statements Indeed. surrounding it. But it wasn't all sweetness and light when Lawrence was here, was it? Completely different, I'd imagine. Certainly he talks about um, having to break water on the well to get breakfast, the eggs freezing in the pantry, in at Christmas 1918, so it was a, a fairly rough, fairly basic uh, cottage, I think. He'd been expelled from Cornwall, along with his wife, for suspicious activities. Why suspicious activities? They thought he was signalling to German submarines when he hung out the washing. Uh, and his wife, of course, was German and, and uh, an object of suspicion. She had letters from uh, Germany via Switzerland, and uh, clearly they were a very dubious couple. How long did they stay here? A year, just a year. I think they were both itching to leave Britain. And uh, in, in 1918, they, they, they went abroad and effectively stayed abroad for the rest of the time. And yet, all the time that he was away, he was writing about this part of the country, wasn't he? It? It's extraordinary, isn't it? How, how vivid the memories were for him of what he called his heartlands. And even his last novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, is set in a kind of Derbyshire and possibly uh, based on uh, Renishaw Park near uh, Bolsover. What do you think his legacy is? Well, he's, he's retained a lot of street credibility. He's still the poet or, or the writer of, uh, of, about animal liberation, about animal welfare, about industrialisation, about gender balance. So he, he, although he was writing 100 years ago or more, he touches on topics which are still relevant today. While Lawrence gave the oppressed and vulnerable a voice, he and his wife, Frida, continued to endure their own battle against discrimination. Here at the old lockup, a police station turned guest house, Lawrence and Frida, who was listed as an alien, had to report once a week during the Great War. And what's now the laundry room was once somewhere much more ominous. Now, this may not look much like a prison cell anymore, but it was. The stark contrasting parentage of his barely literate coal miner father and well-educated lace maker mother may well have shaped Lawrence's love-hate relationship with his homeland. He wrote, the real tragedy of England as I see it is the tragedy of ugliness. The country is so lovely. The man-made England is so vile. 
But in the end, it was Lawrence's ability to create groundbreaking prose from this earthy influence that guaranteed him lasting fame far beyond these shores. And in a way, his unique lament for his motherland echoes through the ages, reaching a new generation who share an impulse to instill a sense of place at the heart of their craft. Farewell, you huntsmen that did hunt the hare. Farewell, you gallant Faulkners, everyone. The chief of all did live at Smitterton. So to conclude, both great and small, those that are left. The Lord preserve us all. A lot of the places in the song are, are pretty close to here, aren't they? The place names are just... They're, the places are named so wonderfully for great meaning and great historical significance. Um, and all of these places, they kind of crept, crept up in everyday life. Where did you find the song? Well, I've actually bought the book. This is the Holy Book of Derbyshire, published in the mid 1800s. There you go. God, it looks as though that edition was published in the 1800s. I'm afraid it's a little bit worse for wear. I've been carrying it up hillsides too much. So it's the Elegy, written by Leonard Wheatcroft. He was a schoolmaster. The song has. 19 verses that that right. song actually has. 19 verses. So you found the lyrics, uh -huh. but you wrote the music? I did. I wrote my own tune to them, which is very much within the folk tradition, actually. But I think it was kind of the, the habit of the time, um, really, to mention as many places as possible and it would become more popular in all those places because everyone wanted to sing about the place that they were from. I know you go all over the world now, don't you? China, Nashville, wherever. Mm -hmm. Do you come back here much? I come back all the time. I can't help myself. There's some kind of historical ties to the land, um, but I just love them and I love the history behind them. And for example, down from Mam Tor, you've got Loose Hill at the end of the Edale Valley, and then across from there, Win Hill. And Loose Hill is actually Loose Hill originally. And there's this idea that these two armies had a battle between these two hills at one point on either side of this valley. And Win Hill won the battle and Loose Hill lost the battle. So all of these place names and all of these places have such wonderful history. And, and once you feel kind of tied into that, it's very hard to leave. Those that are left the Lord preserve us all. And just as Bella Hardy has woven beautiful music around the Portway stories, here in the picturesque Lumsdale Valley, Another history plays out amongst its faded buildings and encroaching forest. This was where visionary inventor Sir Richard Arkwright harnessed the power of nature and pioneered a new era in British history. Although there are only remnants left now, these buildings were part of that huge explosion of productivity that we call the early Industrial Revolution. It was here that the water frame was invented, a massively important invention, both for Britain and overseas, because for the first time, it harnessed the power of water to spin cotton on an industrial scale. At the height of the Industrial Revolution, there were at least seven mills crammed into this narrow dale, at the top of which still cascades a quite stunning waterfall. The stones have long since returned to the wild and the water mills have relinquished their powers, giving way to nature's original plan. I too must move on. 
while on the portway, I've seen how man has imposed himself on the landscape. But at the other end of this tunnel, I'll find out for myself the story of the vengeful power of nature and a simply heartbreaking <laughs> romance. The landscape and history of England's Peak District evokes a delicate dance between man and nature, stones and superstition, literature and industry. And here, back on the ancient portway track, I'm constantly captivated by this beguiling balance between the old and new. And near Birchover, at the base of Cratcliffe Rocks, is a stone-chiselled curiosity within which dwells one of Derbyshire's most remarkable custodians. In the Middle Ages, travellers on the portway like me were dependent on the hospitality of strangers. So the church came to their aid by employing locals to fulfil the task. And the people who provided this invaluable service? The humble hermit. It is on the side of this rock. Yep. Look, there's a stone wall here. Iron railings, I bet they're Victorian. And uh, can I get in? Hey, yep. Result. Yes. Come on. Christ on the cross, about what four foot high, and apart from this damage to the legs, it looks in pretty good nick, doesn't it? Particularly as it's supposed to be 14th century. A little niche there for the candle, and. This, I think, would have been the hermit's bed. Whoa, it's not memory foam, is it? But when he woke up every morning, the first thing that he would have seen would have been this emblem of the crucifixion. In the 13th century, Pope Innocent IV decreed that all such hermits had to be appointed by bishops. They'd often be given servants and pensions. Not bad for a lone cave dweller. It's no coincidence that the hermit lives so close to the portway. He was actually paid to guide people along it. How do we know? Well, there's a place called Haddon Hall, which is about four miles away. And there's a note uh, from its kitchen that says, 23rd of December, 1549, payment to ye hermit for supplying 10 rabbits. And later on, ye Cratcliffe Hermit, this is Cratcliffe, paid four pennies for guiding of people to Haddon. I always thought of hermits as stern and solitary figures, but the Cratcliffe Hermit would have been a highly sociable creature, constantly helping out the portways lost or needy travelers like me. Today's travellers, though, won't be welcomed by a hermit to the nearby village of Winster, though they may enjoy the unexpected sight of a man dressed as a woman and a centuries-old tradition, so old, in fact, that no-one knows where it came from. Morris dancing. Isn't it wonderful that even in a region with as earthy and dour a character as the Peak District, where men were men and women were women, we can still stumble across something as magnificent as Morris dancing. Back on the portway now and back in character, Surprise, surprise, I'm heading back underground again as my journey draws me relentlessly into another tunnel. So much about this view across the valley from Monsell Head epitomises the very ideal of romantic England. But in 1863, its tranquility came to a crashing halt with the arrival of a thrusting new railway line. 
although it connected communities and attracted visitors, not everyone was happy with this groundbreaking feat of engineering. John Ruskin, who was England's foremost critic on culture, certainly didn't hold back. He said, you enterprised a railway through the valley. You blasted its rocks away, heaped thousands of tons of shale into its lovely stream. The valley's gone and the gods with it. And now every fool in Buxton can be in Bakewell in half an hour and every fool in Bakewell at Buxton, which you think a lucrative process of exchange. You fools everywhere. There's no pleasing some people, but Ruskin's reservations aside, I think the Midland Railway line added something thrillingly dynamic to this landscape, reaching across valleys and boring through mountains. Today, though, steam trains can only be seen in the archive. This abandoned track has now been reimagined as walking routes and cycle paths, teeming with whole new generations of travellers. And like a moth to a lamp, I'm drawn to the subterranean once again. These are the tunnels of the Monsell Trail, an eight and a half mile stretch blasted through the Peak District. With the distant light at the end of the tunnel, I find myself thinking that this once pitch black feat of engineering was then the preserve of hurtling steam trains, but now is accessible to all, not least to one of Derbyshire's favorite sons. Hello. Oh, Phil, you're just pottering along. Yes, I am, yes. I'm used to seeing you speeding at the speed That's of light. That's right, yeah, yeah. I'm having an easy day today, yeah. so it's real, real nice. I can tell you're local, I can hear it in your accent. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I make no apologies, to be fair. I'm really proud of where I'm from. And it's a beautiful part of the world, you know. I've, I've been all over the world playing sport, but I'm always glad to get back to Dar Derbyshire. It's uh, very special in my heart. Do you use this place very much? Yes, yeah, so I've been along this path several times. You know, it's an old railway line and now it's got resurfaced and it's just absolutely lends itself to pushing wheelchairs on and actually getting into the countryside, which obviously wheelchairs and such like don't go through fields and well. So this is like a nice corridor through the middle of nowhere, which is absolutely amazing. You know, it's great. What is it about Derbyshire that gets you going? Oh, for me, it just gives me a, a great sense of well-being. Uh, you know, you can get out into the country, the people are really friendly, always someone will speak to you and smile. And, that, and that's just nice, it's just a nice thing. It is fantastic when you go through the tunnel and come out the other side and whoom, there's the light and yeah, the trees. Yeah, I mean, on a day like today, it's beautiful, yeah. And like you say, you, you know, going through a tunnel, it's kind of cold and dark in there. And then you come out and the, particularly the other end where the, you know, where the viaduct is, it's just breathtaking, it's lovely. Oh, I'll leave you to have a look. OK, thank you. See you. Bye. As I leave Phil behind to reacquaint himself with the tunnel, it's incredible to think what he would have been faced with a hundred years ago. Not now, though. The railway era is long gone. And for locals, this dramatic place has opened up a whole host of new possibilities and perspectives. Back on the ancient portway now, and the drama isn't going to let up anytime soon. The pretty village of Eam is about to offer up the portway's darkest story yet. A tragic tale played out in all its beautiful stained glass glory in this 17th century church. This is St Lawrence's. In 1665, Eam was a pretty prosperous place, very successful. Over 700 people lived here. Meanwhile, in London, plague was sweeping through the whole town. In Eam, there's a cottage that we now call Plague Cottage, and in it lived Mrs Cooper, her two sons, and a tailor called George Vickers. There's George down the bottom there with his scissors and his ruler. And he received a parcel of cloth from London, which was damp. So he opened it up, hung it near the fire, gradually the cloth dried out. And presumably in doing so, that activated the plague-ridden fleas. Vickers was soon dying, there he is on his deathbed. And pretty soon the people of Eam realized that they were absolutely engulfed by the plague. 
They decided that they would have to make the ultimate sacrifice. They would have to quarantine. From then on, the people of Eam couldn't get out and the outsiders couldn't get in, which was particularly difficult for these two people, Emmett Siddle and Roland Torre, who were lovers, and they used to meet on either side of the quarantine line. But gradually, Emmett's folk started dying. Six out of eight of her relatives had gone, and she said, Roland, we can't meet anymore because you'll get infected and you'll carry the disease out. And so he walked away brokenhearted. And it wasn't until 14 months later, when the quarantine was finally lifted, that he walked back into the village looking for his sweetheart, and she died too. The plague of Eam raged for 14 months and claimed the lives of at least 260 villagers. By the 1st of November 1666, it had run its course and claimed its last victim. Three hundred and fifty years later, we can only speculate why the people of Eam did what they did. Was it because of their Christian faith? Was it out of hard-headed realism? Was there a lot of peer pressure going on? Well, I suspect all those three factors came into play. But what we do know is that by making the ultimate sacrifice, the people of this village made sure that the folk throughout the rest of the Peak District wouldn't be swept away by this terrible disease. I'm glad to be out in the open again, but I suspect that won't be for long. Up ahead, the portway has something else in store, a plunge into the deep. Mighty rocks gouged from the earth mark man's intrusion on this epic landscape. By carving out these cathedral-like quarries, the people of the portway have fashioned an unlikely beauty from its rocky expanse. But nature too has penetrated this rock-solid surface to create an even more awe-inspiring abyss. The Eldon Hole is a chasm that plunges 60 metres deep into the bowels of Eldon Hill. Eldon is one of the highest limestone hills in the area and dominates the landscape. It was believed to be the fortress of the elves and the local people thought this bottomless hole reached into the very centre of the earth and thus to the abode of the devil himself. In the 1720s, Daniel Defoe visited Eldon Hole and he was so impressed by its depth by its sheer terrifying profundity that he said all the other natural wonders of Derbyshire paled into insignificance compared to it. He wrote, what nature meant in leaving this window open into the infernal world, if the place lies that way, we cannot tell. But it must be said there is something of horror upon the very imagination when one does but look into it. And so frightening is this horrific gash. You don't expect me to explore its inky depths. I mean, ordinarily, I'd be up for it. But for now, I'll leave it to the experts. I'll keep watch up here. Right, you ready to go, mate? I'm ready. Off you go, then. So where we are now is here on the surface. And then there is a 60-metre shaft down to this cavern place here. And then there is another plunge, another 60 metres, down to some water there, but we don't know that for sure. Off my army of potholers go to investigate the innards of this underworld. It's no surprise, really, that in the past such a gloriously evocative place spawned so many dark legends. But wait, there's something down there. Maybe, just maybe, I've bagged my first elves. Have you got them? Yep, I have. Two of them. Two? Fantastic. From the bottom. 
Shall we? Shall we go back up onto the surface and yeah, can have, have a look at them? Oh, bless them! I can see two little faces. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. So, look at that. It's only a young one, isn't it? Yes, I am not surprised you want to bite me. Ouch! Yeah. Should we just let them trot round? Oh, they're walking fine, aren't they? Yeah. They should be all right. That's a relief. Keep an eye on them, though. We don't want them going straight back down again. Are they the only birds you've ever found down there? No, we've found birds down there a few times. Frogs is what we find mostly down there, hundreds of them. And what about animal bones? Because we know, don't we, that a long time ago the farmer was complaining that he kept losing livestock. Yeah, so all the time, so we've been digging this over the last two years and we've been finding animal bones all, all the way down through the rubble. And then Mayday Bank Holiday, we actually found some human bones down there. You're joking. Mm. Uh, there's about 50 bones all together. A, a full jawbone, which is what, you know, we, we, we knew they were human from that. So Dundee University checked them out to get an idea of, of uh, you know, when it was that they, yeah. that, that they died. But the very fact they were 16 metres down, it must be 250 years ago. Do we know how many different individuals? There was, a, there, there was an adult and a child. Are they going to be dated? They are going to be dated, so um, Nottingham University are going to be looking into that. They're going to do some radiocarbon dating on it, so hopefully soon we'll, we'll have an idea. Well, we may not have found any great archaeology this afternoon, but we've rescued two birds. What could be better? <laughs> there they go. My newly liberated jackdaw friends will soon again have the perfect bird's eye view of this magnificent natural wonder. While I, however, being a glutton for punishment, have decided to plunge back once again into another rocky abyss in search of buried treasure. The Treat Cliff Cavern is a series of caves considered to be the finest of their type in Britain. And it's here where Blue John, Britain's rarest mineral, is excavated. Gary! Hey, Tony. You're soaking me with that. Is there a Blue John seam here, Gary? Well, it's right in front of us, just here in the wall. What is it? Is it just this, all this sort of yep. dark, muddy stuff? Yeah, all the purple and the yellow you can see, all that's Blue John. What is Blue John? It's a type of fluorite. Um, in here, it's a very rare type of fluorite, and you only find it in this one hill, nowhere else in the world. Uh, and it's also very good for ornaments and jewellery and things like that. And why is it called Blue John? Well, it's a uh, corruption on the, on the words blue and yellow. It was uh, the French who... Uh, called it the blue and yellow stone back in the 1700s. Uh, they were working the stone, turn it into all sorts of ornaments and things like that. And when they ran out of the stone, they'd say, send us some more of that blue and yellow stone over. Je veux some bleu jeune. And it got lost in translation, yeah. <laughs> it became bleu jeune. That's right. You fancy a girl? All right, yeah, yeah. Can I squeeze past you? Of course here? you can, yeah. That? I'll try and catch it when it comes. Well, I was going to say, I don't want it to come smashing on the floor. Whoa. There you go. Look at that, Tony. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Oh, God, Blige, you hold on. That really is heavy, isn't it? Yeah, it's heavy stuff, Blue John. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? That face is great. Well done. You're a miner. So what will happen to it now? Uh, it'll go outside. We'll have to dry it out for yeah. a few months. And then we'll decide whether we're going to turn it into bowls or jewellery, you know, earrings, bracelets, all that sort of stuff. Right, I'll put my order in. Have a nice bowl, please. I'll see what I can do. Fruit bowl. OK. For the bananas. <laughs> see you. See you, Tony. It's amazing to think that wild dinosaurs stamped the ground above and supercontinents were still fused together, this beautiful gem was taking shape. Millions of years of Earth's magnificent, violent evolution is embedded in its very fibre. I'm heading back on the road for one last time to discover how one tarmac stretch has relinquished its ribbon-like appearance to the rugged beauty of Mother Hill, or Mam Tor. Due to its constantly shifting shale, this Celtic hill fort is also known as Shivering Mountain. Its ceaseless battle against heavy rains causes smaller mounds to collect around its base. 
And when remnants from a nearby lead mine were used to build a road, landslides eventually terminated its track. Man's engineering, once again, defeated by nature. This is the A625 between Sheffield and Manchester. Well, it was the A625 between 1819 and 1979. Just imagine, a little over 40 years ago, this would have been rammed with cars and buses and caravans and police vehicles. Now it's completely slumped. Look on my work, she mighty, and despair. And so as I depart this wondrous wild terrain, where Derbyshire's ancient portway cuts across the Peak District, I've discovered how rocks and stones have shaped the people while Mother Nature has crafted its landscape. Humankind and the might of its industry have carved their own stories, but ultimately, millions of years of natural evolution will always have the upper hand. This ancient place will continue to tell tales etched deep into the stone long after we're gone.